So as far as you growing up in Canarsie, who would you say were some of the guys that you saw around the neighborhood that you said, oh, that's that guy over there? Is there anyone in particular? And then I will I want to talk about some of your interactions that you talk about in the book as far as some incidents that you got into. Um, but other than that, is there anyone in particular that you would see around and you, you certainly knew who they were? Uh, well, Nicky Carrazzo. Okay, yeah. Gambino had, guy. Yeah, he had a place on Avenue L, like a club, a little clubhouse on Avenue L. Mm-hmm. I think it was on 92nd and L, maybe 93rd and Avenue L. Um, his brother, um, Jojo Carrazzo. Yeah. Uh, Frank Serino. Oh, wow, yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, Kanasi had a lot of wise, wise guys, and, and um, but not as many as some of these other neighborhoods. As as uh, you know, like there was a few clubs, like the Walnut that you mentioned that you went to visit. The Walnut was Vic Vic Amuso, of course, uh, everyone knew, and you know, but Vic kept a low profile. Uh, okay. Part, you know, uh, Fat Picciotto. Yeah. Uh. I mean, but these are guys that when I got a little older, well, uh, one of the guys that I actually hang out, hung out with, two of them, they were brothers. I was close with them. And their father actually owned the Walnut. Even though it was really, big. yeah. I, well, we always thought his father owned it. Now, it could have been just on paper or it could right. have been just in word alone and not really, not really the owner. But their father and Vic were very close. Okay. So we always understood that they owned the walnut and that Vic and them just used the place. But but I don't I don't really know like obviously who on paper owned it. Um so when we were teenagers, late teens, you know, like 17, 18, 19, we'd hang out at the walnut and them guys would be there, you know, Fat Pete, uh Lil Al Diaco once in a while, yeah. uh Vic, of course. Yeah, I think, you know, you said that obviously there was other neighborhoods that had more of a mafia presence, but I I don't know, for some reason, I think the thing with Canarsie, it's more of who the mobsters were that came out of that area that kind of maybe makes it a little bigger because you have a lot of brutal characters that came out of there. And I I wanted to ask you about another crew that um, operated in the Flatlands Canarsie area, obviously the the DeMeo crew. I mean, you know, specifically like, let's say the Testa family, I know like Patty and uh, Joey Testa, and then you had Anthony Center. I mean, you must have seen those guys around. I mean, they're, they're, maybe they're about a, a decade older than you, yeah. but you must have known about those those guys. Yeah, well, I went to school with the uh, – um, I think I went to I, – I'm not so sure always. I'm always not sure if it was a cousin or a brother, but there's actually a lot of them, a lot of, yeah. a lot of Testas. And yeah. they're, they're all related, you know. Um, and I went to school with a few of them. Um, they weren't as involved as uh, like Patty. Everybody knew Patty had the car place. Everybody knew what he was up to. Uh, yeah. You know, as far as stolen cars and buying a car and getting it stolen from your house the, the following week. Yeah. Um, everybody, you know, everybody knew what they were up to. Um, Joey Tesla, I didn't really know. I've, I've seen him around, but I didn't really know him. Um, and Patty, I, I didn't know either, but he had dated a girl that I knew, even though she was a uh, somewhat younger than him. Um, but uh, Paulie Barrio is another guy from my neighbor. He only lived a few blocks from my house. You know, wow. yeah. once in a while. But um, like guys like Henry Hill, I didn't know, you, you know, I don't even know if he was in or if he was out. You know, I, I have no clue, clue uh, about him or Jimmy Burke. But but you're right. There were a lot of notable guys that, that came out of Kanasi. Yeah, yeah. So let's see. So now you did get involved. I mean, you didn't get involved, but you did find yourself in a couple of situations. Two of them in particular that I that I uh, listened to from the I had the audio book. I was listening to the book, and uh, one situation in particular. You're with your friends. You're outside a pizzeria, and they start making trouble with the owner that comes by, and he basically tells you guys to leave. You being smart figures out, you know what? I am going to leave, but your friends stay. Can you tell me about that situation and, and tell me, tell us all who that particular pizza owner was. Yeah. So it's kind of a, you know, it's um, sometimes you get lucky in life, you know, Uh, whether it was my smarts or just a little bit of luck or a little bit of both. 
we it was a summer night a lot of people were out and we were like 16 17 years old and um so we were pretty wild kids you know we all we were all on the same football th- high school football team um we like you know we always were handsy with each other like pushing and punching and that kind of stuff uh and this particular night we, we were you know we didn't have i think it was before any of us had a car so we were probably like 16 16 maybe 17 and we walk literally sometimes we walk all over canals just looking to hang out or meet we meet up with other people this particular night we ended up stopping in front of a pizzeria on flatlands avenue and um i don't even think we went in for pizza we were just hanging out goofing around with each other and guy italian guy comes out with a like a pizza apron on and tells us to move it, it, not not in a bad way but not in a super polite way either. and we just yes him to death yeah okay we're moving but we don't move you know and then he comes out again with a little bit of a more of an attitude um and again we tell him yeah yeah we're moving we're moving well, he comes out one more time, and now we get a little belligerent back with him and basically tell him to go fuck himself and get out of here and, go, you know, fuck off. Well, at this time, we'd already been in front of the place a long time, breaking each other's chops and goofing off, and I was just, me and one of the other guys were like, we're ready to go home for a night. It was kind of getting a little, not that it was so late, but it was late enough. We didn't had enough, and we were going home. And again, there were other people going in and out of the pizzeria, driving by, saying hello to us, uh, you know, all the other Guys that hang out with pass by, beat the horn, stop us, and we were done. Me and my friend, one of my friends left. My other friends, the rest of us, the rest of my friends stayed. So I think it was four, or well, I think four guys stayed. And um, the guy comes out again. This time he comes out with a baseball bat to get rid of my friends. Well, like I said, my friends are pretty tough guys, and they, um, and they. My friends were pretty tough guys. When he came out with the baseball bat, they ended up taking the bat away from him. Not that that was any great feat. I mean, the guy was, I want to say, probably 50 at the time. And my friends were pretty tough, athletic kids. They took the bat away from him, and they beat him, beat the uh, beat the guy pretty good, basically. Uh, it turns out that the guy they beat up is Bruno Facciolo, who, <laughs> you know, now I, a lot of people know who he was. And to be honest, we knew the name, you know, you talk about like guys in the neighborhood that were wise guys. A lot of them we knew by face and name. This guy, this name, we all knew Bruno and we knew what he did and uh, what kind of life he led or how tough he was, but we didn't know what he looked like. Well, this guy who came out this three or four times was Bruno and my friends did a number on him. And um, I was already gone. But apparently, um, somebody gave the names of the people that beat up Bruno, all my friends. And my name wasn't mentioned. All my friend that left for me wasn't mentioned because we weren't there at the time of the beating, luckily. And um, Bruno got, got, got retribution for, for what happened. Yeah, I can imagine. So you're saying he was in an apron, so he would be there, like, making pizza or... You know, I, ne- I never went in, to be honest, I don't remember going into the place. So I don't know if he actually made pizza. It was his place. So maybe he went behind the counter. Who knows, you yeah. know? Um, wow. But he had an apron on. Uh, and like I said, nobody knew who he was. So, so some of the guys you know, get uh, they end up getting beat up pretty bad for that, huh? Well, one of them um, ended up with a plate in his head. Wow. Yeah. Another friend of mine was driving to work. Uh, I want to say a few weeks later, maybe maybe not too not too long later, not too long after the incident. And he was in his. Uh, he did construction, so he get up early in the morning, and he used to use the boss. The boss had given him the truck to use, and he was driving. I don't know six in the morning. He gets in his truck and he gets cut off. And guys with store off shotguns get out and they shoot up the truck, and they hit wow. him. Uh, Pretty good. He don't die, but he, they they get they get they hit him uh, with the shots. Uh, another guy got he just took off. He just left. He took the minute he heard what was going on. He just left for for quite a long time to avoid. Wow. Uh, 
No punch, man. And um, two of the, the two of the guys were set up actually by by probably Vic Vic Amuso. Okay. Because Vic can, you know, Vic was close to the family. They thought they were going to get a, a sit down and have everything taken care of. And on the way there, they got they got jumped by the wow. by now. Yeah. So for people that don't know, watching. Uh... Bruno Facciolo, Lucchese mobster. He was a powerful guy in Canarsie. I know he had a lot of restaurants. He had the pizzeria, had a big gambling operation. You know, unfortunately for him, he would get killed in 1990 by uh, Gaspipe and Amuso and those guys. But um, that's a crazy story. Luckily, you know, you, you, know, uh, you know what's interesting about his his murder? Um, I actually, I think I mentioned it in my book when I was. Um, I actually was on trial for another for a drug case, and uh, uh, I believe I was in Brooklyn Southern uh, Brooklyn uh, Federal Court, but it might have been Southern District. I'm not sure, Eastern or Southern. Um, whoever was prosecuting Vic, uh, again, Eastern District or Southern District, I don't remember. But I was on trial uh, for a case I was doing. Under, I did an undercover on, and Vic's trial was going on at the same time. Oh wow! And I went to went to the trial when I had some downtime with my trial. And one of the days I went to little Al Diaco, yeah. who had at some point become the acting boss of Lucchese, uh, was testifying. <clears throat> and he was telling the story of how Bruno Facciola got killed. And most people know that he got taken to a warehouse and they, they shot him and you know that kind of thing. But um, what was interesting, I found it very interesting actually, um, what was interesting was he had been uh, told by Vic and Gas to go to California and clip some guy. I forgot yeah. who I know I've seen it and I, I I don't remember who, but Vic and Gas had told him to go to California and clip some guy. And he brought actually a kid I went to school with, a guy named Anthony Grado, who was actually a pretty good friend of mine. He took Anthony Grado and I think Al took his own son. So they went to California to kill this guy. And um Was that Delappy? I think maybe. What's that? Delappy? Is that who that is? Maybe. I'm not sure. To be honest, I, yeah. I don't really know. But um they went to California to kill this guy. And um they took Anthony Grado, who eventually becomes a, a made guy with the Lucchese, but they end up shelving Anthony Grado uh several years later. He became a involved became like a drug, a heroin addict, from what I understand. But wow. They went to California to clip this guy. And um, when they came back, the two mafia cops uh, said something to Gaspipe about uh, Little Al. Uh, they knew that Little Al did the homicide. And they said Little Al. They were told, an informant told some other NYPD uh, FB, and FBI task force guys that Little Al did this homicide. When word got back to Little Al, to, to Al Diaco, he, now this is him saying this on the stand. He said, the only guy that calls me Little Al is Bruno Facciolo. <laughs> so, when, when, so when the cops, the Rafia cops who were dirty, obviously told him the word got back that Little Al did this homicide in California, simply because they used the word Little Al, and the only person that called out the awful little Al was Bruno. They assumed that Bruno was a rat. So that's and where they got it. it from. That's where they got the. That's where they wow. got from this information that that Bruno was a rat, which he wasn't. Yeah. And they killed him. They even stuffed a canary or some bird in his mouth after they killed him. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Crazy, right? That is insane, man. Yeah. And speaking about that pizzeria, that's uh, in Little Al's book uh, with Jerry Capisi. He talks about that pizzeria being the last spot that Tommy DeSimone has seen. Uh, you know, Joe Pesci's character in Goodfellow. That's the last spot. He's at the pizzeria with Bruno Fatiola and uh, I believe Paul Vario's son. And that's kind of the last spot that place that he's ever seen alive. And then, you know, where he ended up, nobody even knows. But we can only imagine. Well, and you're they saying use, they used Bruno and his brother on that. I don't know who actually did the shooting. I don't think. I'm not sure if anyone actually knows who did the shooting of Tommy DeSimone, but uh, Bruno's brother was a Gambino guy. 
yes. uh, Gambino soldier. And of course, Bruno was a Lucchese soldier. And Tommy Di Simone killed the Gambino guy. So they used him to, they used the Gambino Facciolo to negotiate with his brother how they were going to set up Tommy Di Simone. And, and that's, that's probably why he was at the pizzeria. And that's when they put Yeah. Him. Wow. Yeah. Crazy stuff. Crazy. So one, <laughs> yeah. So one more story you tell. I think it was, I think that you had just taken the police test around 83. Is that correct? No, I came on in 83. I probably took the test in 80 or 81. Okay. So 80 or 81. I think you mentioned that you took the police test, but right before you took it, your friends mentioned that they had a little piece of work that they wanted you to get in on. Yeah. These were like the guys that were involved with the Bruno hit or Bruno incident were like my regular friend, like guys I hung out with all the time. We played football. Okay. Like I said, we played high school football together. I actually grew up with a couple of those guys since kindergarten. Wow. Uh, I knew them at the time already 17 years or uh, whatever, uh, 14 years, 13 years. Um, but this other incident were guys that I knew I didn't hang out with constantly. You know, I would just see them. And uh, one guy, actually, I was pretty close with when we were y- very young. And then actually both of them, when we were young, like uh, 11, 12, 13, I was pretty close with them. Then we kind of went our own way. And, um, but I would see them occasionally. And I saw them actually one day and they said they were going to do this. Uh, there was a bar in Red Hook and it had Joker, Joker poker machines used to be really big, um, big money makers. And there was a couple of Joker poker machines, uh, some cigarette machines. And maybe pinball. I don't remember. Something else, I think, was in there. And um, they were going to, It was, the place was in Red Hook. It was a closed down bar. And they were going to go in there and steal these, these machines for Eddie Lino, who was a Gambino guy. And yeah. I had never seen Eddie Lino, um, but I knew he was a Gambino guy. I knew he was close to John Gotti. Um, and I also knew at the time, None of my friends dealt with drugs, coke, or any of that shit. I mean, uh, like I said, we all play ball and stuff, so um, none, of them, none of us were really into drugs. I was never into drugs at, at all, but I mean, maybe like a couple of them would smoke pot and stuff, but none of my close friends were into coke, but I knew guys that were coke, who moved coke, uh, and it was pretty common knowledge that Eddie Lino was su- supplying yeah. a lot of young guys with coke in Canasi, and they were moving for him. So I knew the name, but in any event, they wanted to, these guys were going to make, make some money going in and, and, and stealing these machines on behalf of Eddie Lino. And he was going to pay them to do it. And they asked me if I'd come with them because there was a, a fence in the yard and it was kind of high and they figured I could get over it quick and get in the place and open. And that's what I did. So they had this, uh, they got this van and we, we went over to Red Hook. And um, we went in into the. I went into the joint. I went. I hopped the fence. I went into a window. I opened the front door for them. They came in, and we all unloaded all these Joker poker machines and cigar machines into this. Um, it was more of a box truck than a van, actually. Uh, and that's what we did. And then we hooked up with Eddie Lino, who was supposed to pay us to, you know, for the for the for the job we just did, you know. And um, he was an arrogant guy, you know, very cocky. Uh, and he didn't really, wasn't too happy about paying us, you know? <laughs> yeah. He, yeah. In fact, he was, he was probably looking to sniff us. And um, I was talking, to, so we had to meet him in the park. We met him in Marina Park with the truck full of stuff. And I thought that was going to, basically, I thought that was the end of it. When we met him there. He was going to take control of the vehicle with all the stuff in it, and we're going to get paid. Well, when we get there, all of a sudden, the game's going to change. He wanted us to follow him somewhere, and then he said he would pay us. But I, to be honest, I wasn't believing him at this point. In fact, I was kind of angry with my friend for, you know, I don't want to say dragging me into it, but I thought it was a short thing that we were getting going there and getting paid. And, yeah. Um, now we got to take this stolen stuff somewhere else. And, you know, it was more of a risk than I, I had bargained for. And Eddie, you know, heard me kind of arguing with my friend, so to speak. 
and he called me over and he was pretty pissed like you know uh and i, I to be honest i wasn't sure if he was gonna swing at me or if he was gonna pull his gun out and, and, and shoot me because he you know he just had that kind of uh you know, belitt belittling attitude, you know? Yeah. I mean, we were all kids, obviously, and he was an adult, but he kind of, you know, uh, made you feel like a kid or wanted to make you feel like a kid, you know? Um, and he asked me who I was and where I was from, and he kind of, like, paid me by throwing, like, throwing, throwing the money at me. Like, he begrudgingly gave me my money for doing this. Uh, and then I just left. I didn't stay with my friends. I told them, you got you... Because now they... They were a little upset that I got paid and they didn't. And I was like, well, you you guys negotiated this fucking deal, man. You get <laughs> and that was it. They took the van wherever they went. And I got to ride home. And that, that was it. Yeah, a guy like that, he's probably like, oh, these guys are probably gangsters in training. They're probably lucky to even, you know, have the opportunity to do a job for me. They should be thankful, you know? That's exactly right. And you know, uh, like, so we, we should be uh, thankful to him for letting us almost got arrested you know yeah yeah and and again like bruno for those that don't know you know eddie lino gambino guy massive drug trafficker uh he was said to be one of the shooters on the castellano hit and he also gets killed in 1990 more mafia cops stuff more uh louis epolito steven caracappa they they uh they kill him on the side of the, the bell parkway over there yeah so when you so that makes the paper. So you had that interaction with him. So then let's say 10 or more years later, that's in the papers. They even have his picture in the car. What did you think when you saw that? Did you did you recollect back to that moment? Like, holy crap. Yeah, well, I mean, like I even after the incident, I had no guys I had dealings with him. Um, and he had no qualms about being a nasty guy. And, you know, I, I knew guys that had problems, you know, problems with him. Um and, you know, the, the bottom line is these guys either end up, in, for the most part, either end up dead or in jail. So yeah, it really was yeah. a surprise, you know. When it happened, well, nobody knew who did it. You know, they just, I, you know, like I have, I've had friends and people I knew get shot in cars before and uh, no arrests had, had ever been made, you know. Um, so I just figured there were people sitting in the back seat. He was going somewhere and, you know, his, his, own, his own people clipped him, you know. But, um, yeah. Well, you know, mafia cops uh, did the job, obviously. Crazy. So you have that uh, growing up with Canarsie, and then and said you, in 83, you get on the force. 